Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is the third weekly economic outlook. I regret that it's not going to be very much different from the last two. It's coronavirus front and center, not least because of Boris Johnson's recent admission to St. Thomas's. Uh, the collapse in the oil price is about 25 lengths behind, and I don't think it's going to get much closer for a while. Now, what is there to say about the virus or about COVID? 19 to be more specific. If you remember, I tried to offer a slightly heterodox view in the last couple of weeks, uh, suggesting first of all that whatever the mainstream media might say, the science is not yet settled. And second, I was trying to get across the message that we ought not to dismiss Trump's insistence that the cure should not be worse than the disease. I'll repeat the same message again this week. I assume that by now, many of you, perhaps most of you, will have read the posts by Hector Drummond that have pretty much uh, gone viral, which I accept is an unfortunate phrase. So you know, therefore, that first of all, that there was a good deal of bad blood, professional and personal, between the imperial team of epidemiologists and statisticians and the team at Oxford that disagreed with it. I'm surprised, personally, that number 10 didn't seem to weigh this before committing itself so wholeheartedly to the imperial lot, particularly since Professors Anderson and Ferguson didn't exactly cover themselves with glory during the BSE crisis when they vastly overstated the likely impact on human health. The second point is that you're probably also aware that so far, and I agree that it is only so far, there is no real sign of excess deaths in most European countries, excess deaths being those in excess of what we would normally expect at this time of the year, though there clearly is in Italy. Here in the UK, where almost 5,000 people have been officially certified as having died of C coronavirus, though almost all had underlying health problems and many probably died with it rather than of it, uh, we have approximately 620,000 deaths a year. So 5,000 isn't quite so terrifying. In the US in a normal year, there are about 2.8 million deaths. So again, what sounds terrifying really ain't necessarily so. Now, I assume that you've also all also read the letter in The Independent and the op-ed piece in yesterday's Sunday Times that Jonathan Sumption wrote which one leading economist of my uh, acquaintance who really should know better described as, and I quote, a deranged obscenity. It is not. What Sumption says is absolutely common sense. This is, and I quote, not the Black Death. And there's a serious danger that government policy will impose, as he puts it, an authoritarian pattern of life utterly inconsistent with our traditions. If anyone can really explain to me why the police in big shiny BMW should be harassing individuals who are sitting on the grass in London parks at what the government says is a safe distance, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. Lord Sumption is not alone. Mervyn King, the ex-governor of the Bank of England, has also predicted that the young will rebel if social distancing rules are not relaxed. And the anger at Sunday's closing of Brockwell Park in South London uh, demonstrates that he's likely to be proved right. Now, of course, we all need more testing. Nobody disputes that. And though it sounds heartless, given that fewer than 25% of our frontline medical and care staff have been tested so far, what we really, really need is random testing. Without random testing, we really don't know how many people have coronavirus. How many are asymptomatic? Which demographic groups are particularly susceptible? And so on. Without random testing, we really cannot make sensible policy. And as a result, policy is being made by the most hysterical. In this case, though I normally love it, that is best represented, I think, by the Daily Mail. Fortunately, we do have a couple of others to watch, a couple of outliers to watch, notably Sweden where the government stuck to its guns on the herd immunity theory that was so quickly shot down over here. I'm also quite interested in Bolsonaro's Brazil, 
Now, he may indeed be a hard-right hard right neo-fascist, but he has clearly come to the conclusion that with very high unemployment and a weak social security system, Brazil's priority has to be to restart the economy as quickly as possible. Hence his urging of people back to work after a two-week quarantine period. And just to show political even-handedness, I also note that Daniel Ortega, remember him? Cool glasses, Ray-Bans, held a coronavirus festival in Nicaragua last week. I wouldn't necessarily endorse that approach, but we'll see. So that's the science stuff. It ain't settled, and we need a lot more testing. Oh, and while we're at it, don't have a heart attack. Don't have a stroke. Don't get appendicitis. Don't get too thick. I'm told that the NHS is setting up a two-track system, but until now, the huge emphasis on coronavirus means that cancer clinics are being postponed, serious operations are being cancelled, and people are dying who would otherwise not have died. Anyway, let's move on to what I really have to say, which is that the economy, the global economy, not just the UK economy, is teetering on the edge of a downturn as bad or perhaps even worse than the Great Depression of the early 1930s. Yes, governments have more tools at their disposal now than they did then. And they can, and I hope they will, provide a safety net that didn't exist 80 years ago. But don't kid yourself. That comes at a price. Loading the economy up with debt, even if much of it is government guaranteed, will mean years, perhaps decades, of low growth. And as some economists are starting to understand, it will be a very different economic model, one in which the state, which currently controls about 38% of the economy, plays a much more active and much bigger role. Some people see that as a good thing. I think it's a disaster. Entrepreneurs who built up a business and then saw it destroyed in a fortnight are going to learn the lesson particularly when they have to deal with smug bureaucrats with cast iron pensions. Don't risk it. Join the civil service. Or if you can't get into the treasury or the department of work and pensions, join some outfit that is deemed too big to fail. Deloitte's, for instance, or HSBC. Don't try to innovate. Don't risk your own money or your own family. That will be the message that intelligent people take away. Anyway, what are the economy? The key economic releases last week were, first and foremost, the final purchasing managers indices for March, which amplified the terrifying message that the previous week's flash uh, numbers gave. They were awful, particularly for services, which were quicker to respond than manufacturing. And bear in mind that although these are final, final numbers, they are still only based on the first three weeks of the month. Here in the UK, for instance, the services PMI fell from 53.2 to 34.5. 50 is break even. Below that, the sector is shrinking. In the Eurozone as a whole, the services PMI fell from 52.6 to 26.4. In Italy, it fell from 52.5 to only 17.4. In the US, it fell from 49.4 to 39.1. There is, however, one outlier, China. Its services PMI actually improved from 29.6 to 52.3. Now, I realize that there are people who watched last week's video who felt that pointing out that the country that produced the, uh, the crisis in the first place stands to lose least and may actually benefit from seizing markets in the emerging world that Western companies have had to abandon is racist. But it's true. Even if we're skeptical about Chinese figures for coronavirus, there is no doubt that the country is back at work and we are not. The second stunning economic release of last week came on Thursday. Initial weekly jobless claims in the United States. Two weeks ago, they were 3.3 million up from 280. This last week, it was 6.6 million and this week it may be even more as the state authorities work through the backlog. This is absolutely unprecedented. It undoes all the job creation that has taken place in the United States over the last 20 years. The third key release was linked to that. It was the figure for US non-farm payrolls in March, which was released on Friday. 
This was also a stunner, a fall of 701,000. Again, it was only based on the first three months of the, of the three weeks of the month, and there is undoubtedly worse to come. However, it was seven times worse than the markets expected, and that was really significant. But while the US is important, it's not that important. This is a global crisis, and the US is actually running behind most of the other industrial countries. Here, for instance, 950,000 people applied for universal credit after March the 16th, almost 10 times what would normally be expected, and half a million have already been furloughed. In the EU more broadly, the Services Sentiment Index for March fell, that's a separate measure from the, MN, uh, the PMI, from 27.5 to 6.5, while the Manufacturing Index fell from minus 1.2 to minus 2.1, which is quite a big, minus 21, which is quite a big shift. In Spain, where the unemployment rate was already 14% before the crisis, 800,000 people lost their jobs last month. In Ireland, 34,000 companies have applied for government wage subsidies. Everywhere, small businesses and startups are going to the wall, even where, as in the case of the UK, the government is throwing money at the problem. Eligibility requirements are obviously a big hurdle. So is the fact that almost everywhere, governments are trying to use the existing banking system as an intermediary to pass on its, its support. Naturally, naturally, the banks don't want to take on any extra risk, even if it's only 20% of the risk, not 100%. And that adds another level of delay and frustration, and it will push more companies to the wall. Of course, there are those who see a silver lining to all of this. A columnist in yesterday's Sunday Times, for instance, suggested that the coronavirus outbreak would, and I quote, purge the system of companies that didn't really deserve to exist. I guess he figures his job is safe. I hope it isn't. And it's not just industrial countries. As the IMF's Kristalina Georgieva pointed out, the world economy has come to a standstill and emerging markets are going to be hit with a double whammy. The virus itself, if indeed it turns out to be as virulent in poorer and hotter countries as Imperial's models suggest, and the fact that export markets have dried up. This is fertile territory for China's soft power and for its Belt and Road Initiative, not least because Western investors have already pulled $95 billion out of emerging market stocks and bonds, much more than they did during the great financial crisis. South Africa got downgraded last week. Turkey, Tunisia, Sri Lanka, Angola, Oman, Bahrain are all on the fund's death watch list, and there are going to be many, many more added. Now, one bit of good news is that equity markets seem to have quietened down a bit, thanks to the unprecedented amounts of money that are being thrown at the problem. In the US, that includes the Fed's essentially unlimited commitment to more and more quantitative easing. It also includes the biggest bailout package in history, the $2.2 trillion Carreza bill signed into law by President Trump at the beginning of last week. This is pretty much as we talked about. It includes a $450 billion bailout fund for industry, a huge increase in the Treasury's Exchange Trade Stabilization Fund, up to $600 a week in extra unemployment benefits, a paycheck protection plan, which are the like for SMEs, and a personally signed check for up to $1,200 for every American taxpayer from Uncle Donald. Here, Chancellor Sunak's pledges so far amount to well over 60 billion and other European governments, 60 billion pounds, and other European governments have more or less matched that. There is much more to come. As a result, no surprise, equity markets have recovered a bit, though for March as a whole, the S&P was off 20%, the FTSE was down 29%, the DAX was off 28%, the CAC 40 was down 31%, and even the Nikkei was off 25%. Ironically, if that's the word, the Shanghai Comp was down just 10%. Note what that means. 
Those of us whose pension pots are invested in equities have lost almost a third of our liquid wealth. Does anyone seriously think that won't affect consumption patterns and behavior when we come out of this? And of course, for those looking to annuitize their savings, forget it. At, at these interest rates, civil servants and people on gold-plated pensions are millionaires and the rest of us are paupers. A couple of other things. The first is obviously oil. We may still have it in the back of our minds that low oil prices are a good thing for the global economy, but you can have too much of a good thing. The drop in oil prices could be catastrophic for poorer countries, and it could well be devastating for the US economy as well, since America is now the world's largest producer, pumping over 13 million barrels a day, mostly from tight oil wells that need 30 to 35 bucks oil to be commercially viable. Now, at the beginning of last week, the price of Witty West Texas Intermediate, which is one of the key marker crudes, uh, was around $21.95 a barrel, with Brent, the other marker crude, at $25.15. And many observers were predicting that it could fall to single figures. Indeed, it did fall. Although market, market crude prices mostly managed to stay above $20 a barrel, it was widely reported that oil was actually changing hands at Midland, Texas, which is the key base for oil trading in, in Texas, as low as $7 a barrel. And oil from Canada's Athabasca tar sands was virtually being given away. On the demand side, it was also reported last week that global crude demand is down 25% and falling. But in a way, it's on the supply side that people are really worried. It is said now that there is surplus production around the world of 15 to 20 million barrels a day. And that was before April the 1st, when Saudi Arabia and Russia had both threatened to ramp up their production to put US frackers out of business once and for all. The key, I guess, is whether in the face of this massive glut, Riyadh and Moscow really will increase their output. There was certainly a lot of telephone calls last week, including calls from the Texas Railroad Commissioner, who bizarrely regulates oil production in Texas, to Russia's oil minister, Alexander Novak, and to the Secretary General, Secretary General of OPEC. Trump went higher. He called Putin and Mohammed bin Salman and announced, perhaps prematurely, that they had jointly agreed to take 15 million barrels a day off the market. Maybe, or maybe not. There is apparently going to be a telephone virtual meeting of OPEC Plus this week, perhaps as early as today. But I think a little skepticism is in order. Even though one assumes the US has leverage over Saudi Arabia, it's not clear that it has much leverage over Russia unless it is willing to ease sanctions. And that's a highly political issue. The fact that Russia diverted a plane load of much needed medical equipment to Washington last week may be actually good news, even if it pissed off a lot of Russians. But we'll have to see whether Trump can withstand the inevitable blowback from the die-hard cold warriors in Congress and at the Pentagon. That said, I note a sharp rise in oil prices over the weekend, with Witty now being quoted at around $29 a barrel and Brent at $34.65. With luck, that means something's up. What else? Well, I would point to the rash of stories about hedge funds and private equity companies taking advantage of the crisis to pick up assets on the cheap and to exacerbate the crisis by shorting the market. Bill Ackman of Pershing Square's admission that he made $2.6 billion on the way down didn't help. Will there be a political backlash to this? Well, short selling has already been banned in several continental European markets, but this time politicians may be keen to go a bit further. As for this week, well, there'll be a lot of attention on the OPEC Plus meeting. But what I think will be really interesting will be the continuing effort by a so-called gang of nine within the Eurozone, led by France, Italy, Spain and Portugal, to railroad Germany, Austria and the Netherlands into agreeing to mutualize the response to the coronavirus panic by issuing so-called corona bonds with an EU-wide guarantee. 
Mrs. Merkel isn't keen, but she's on the way out. And my guess is that she'll just throw up her hands eventually and sign on the dotted line. Closer to home, we will have the full outline of our new Labour leader, Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet. I'm impressed by Annalise Dodds. She came and talked at a CSFI event and I thought she was terrific. So she's good news. We'll see who else is in the key economic positions. Other than that, see you next week.